Good evening, everybody who's watching the program from India, and good afternoon to those who are watching from the United Kingdom. Today is our 81st live webinar, and we have distinguished faculty, Professor Justin Cobb from the United Kingdom. Justin is the chair of orthopedics at Imperial College London, where he runs a musculoskeletal lab, is a Sir Michael Uren Biomedical Engineering Hub, the 12th floor of clinicians, engineers, and scientists. Focus of his laboratory work is joint preservation with novel devices such as H1, the world's first all ceramic hip resurfacing. The other focuses on assistive technologies, robotics, 3D printers, and enhanced reality headsets, all help making us better surgeons. Clinically, Justin's works again focus on joint preservation, both hip resurfacing and compartmental knee arthroplasty. After training in Oxford and London, Prof. Justin was consultant orthopedic surgeon at UCL for, from 1991 to 2005. He was appointed to King Edward VII Hospital for officers in 1998 and became orthopedic surgeon to Her Majesty the Queen in 1998. He's a member of the International Health Society, the European Knee Society, and is ex-president of the CAOS International. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Prof. Justin Cobb, for this fantastic lecture on hip resurfacing. Over to you, Prof. Hitesh, thank you for those kind words. Um, can you see, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, Prof. Great. So I'm going to just whiz through the world, seen through my eyes at the moment, I suppose. Um, and we'll talk about hip resurfacing and whether it really is indeed re-emerging now. Um, this is our, my group, and this is our new building in London, uh, in West London. Do please come and visit us. Um, as soon as the um, coronavirus allows those things to happen. So where are we today? Um, currently, I think we, everybody saw um, Andy Murray's amazing return to the tennis court very soon after his hip resurfacing, which really went against the grain of the current state of orthopedic knowledge, which was that total hip arthroplasty is doing very well and hip resurfacing arthroplasty wasn't doing so well and so the usage of that of hip resurfacing has really dropped down around the world to a very low level so why is that what do we really know and what's the quality of our knowledge um, today if we go back almost 10 years ago these are figures from the national joint registry of england and wales um, this is the risk of dying um, following um, the blue line there is following a cemented hip replacement and the orange line is following hip resurfacing. Now, of course, that's observational data. There's lots of selection bias there. And this is the risk of revision surgery, the other way around, of course. And of course, it's also observational data with terrible selection bias. Actually, this is the Australian Joint Registry up to date, showing this is now actually corrected for age and comorbidity and gender, showing again that big spread of difference in life expectancy with those two procedures. Um, and this is again from the Australian Registry separating out um, osteonecrosis, developmental dysplasia and, and osteoarthritis. So it does seem as though the, the results for hip resurfacing in revision, if revision is failure terms alone, um, hasn't changed much over the years, but there is this question about whether it's a safer procedure. Now, 2012, we presented at the American Academy um, a very closely matched um, groups of patients with very, very good quality um, PROMs, but showing that at high speeds, there was a significant difference between the top walking speed of a hip resurfacing and the top walking speed of a replacement. These are the fastest hip replacements in the world, much slower than the hip resurfacings. No one would publish this. We could not get this paper published. What it showed was that just the hip resurfacing were walking as fast as healthy controls. And the replacements were good, but they were nothing like normal people, whereas the resurfacing were quite like normal people. And that really, it was about the stride length. So this is stride length, these are normal people, these are resurfacing, and these are replacements. No one would publish this. We tried very hard to get this published. We could get published the following year, a group of patients with one of each, so their own controls. So of course, there's no bias here. These are people with one hip replacement and one hip resurfacing. And in them, walking uphill, you see the red line here 
is the replaced hip, the blue line is the resurfaced hip, and the green line are the healthy controls. So resurfaces aren't the same as healthy controls, but they're nearly the same. The replacements, although they're good, aren't like normal people. The following year, um, um, Adrian Kendall in his PhD thesis from, from Oxford showed that huge difference in more mortality between the two procedures. The, the, this is highly corrected for age, gender, comorbidity, every single comorbidity possible. And out of 10 years, there was this big difference between resurfacing and replacement, whether cemented or cementless. Um, really a substantial difference, so a hazard ratio of 0.5. 2018, this is the five-year follow-up of a randomized controlled trial, and this is EQ5D, and if you look at the black lines there, that's EQ5D for resurfacing, randomized, that's EQ5D for replacement. Seems like it's different. And last, just last year, Hope van Sosante from the Netherlands um, having failed to show in a randomized trial of resurface against replacement, failed to show a difference using PROMS, when he used our case analysis, um, he then was able to show a significant difference here. So these are the, um, this is normal walking speed, this is top walking speed for replacement and a resurfacing. Um, absolutely symmetric, the red line there is, is the replaced one. And here's the, um, the randomized group. This is the people who've had a hip replacement, the red line, and this is their good leg. These are going about 10% slower than the resurfaced, and the good leg, the unreplaced leg, is having to work much harder to push off. So that stem down the femur does seem to have a real effect on your mechanical efficiency. So these are things we know today um, from, the, from the objective literature. But actually, of course, it's not about the operation, it's really about the diagnosis. And the three diagnoses that, or even four, I'd say, that really matter at the moment, I want to just whiz through them. First of all, most importantly, um, in some parts of the world, particularly in, in, um, in the People's Republic of China and, and in, in Korea, avascular necrosis is a big diagnosis, of course, as it is in the subcontinent. And, Lesion size and sight, of course, absolutely dictate the outcome of that, those particular devices. We've got the ARCO classification, which is okay. FECAT, which is easy to use, but Zex and Zeng and um, Simon uh, Harris in, in my lab are trying to do 3D modeling of the size of the lesion with a view to actually being able to describe in sort of global coordinate terms, the actual volume and size of the lesion um, with a view to a more conservative approach to revisit perhaps the uh, mid-head um, device for severe, severe lesions in osteonecrosis. Um, in CAM type FAI, which is very common in, in, in Europe, less common in the subcontinent, um, Simon some time ago with Milad Nurse Jedi showed we could do mathematics to really describe the shape of the CAM and the shape of the head in this and actually mathematically describe exactly what needs to be corrected in CAM type arthrosis. Um, Jeff NG um, has done some lovely work on dysplasia showing how to optimize PAOs for coverage but looking at the impact of um, instability by, by doing that um, PAO you definitely do slacken off the um, iliofemoral ligament and perhaps introduce a little bit of instability in a joint that's got a very small surface area. So PAO is a really effective procedure, but if the condition is bad, the prognosis is of course much bad, much worse. Finally, spine hip relations. Charles Rivière published some very nice work. Um, I think every single hip surgeon recognizes that if you've got a stiff spine, your hip has to work much harder. And if you don't know exactly where the pelvis is in space as a consequence of that spinal fusion, then your hip arthroplasty may well not go so well. So spine hip relations are very important. But what I take away from all of the conservative type surgery is that resurfacing might be a better option for, for anybody with more than very early disease. So we've really noticed how if you do a, re a resurfacing you get a fantastic function. We haven't got lots of fantastic function from our conservative hip arthroplasty. So first of all, I want to talk about just how you plan um, resurfacing. 
Now, in, in a simple case, so here's a, a relatively simple case of a, a man, he's got psoriatic arthritis, so he's got normal anatomy, normal neck um, shaft angles, normal shape before his arthrosis, and very happy nine years after his hip resurfacing. Um, but now you can't have resurfacing unless your head, femoral head size is over 48. And his was 46. So this is actually the very first H1 we did. But we, in this case, all we're doing is we're just putting the femoral head exactly where it was. We're just putting the acetabulum exactly where it was. This is almost a mechanical event. And we just resurfaced him. He's now two years out. He's very happy with his um, resurfacing. Here's a more difficult one with a, a substantial dysplasia. I think it's still probably just Crow 2, but it's a bad Crow 2 with still osteonecrosis of the femoral head after her her um, early intervention in childhood. And so planning here, we've got to adjust leg length, we've got to really adjust the acetabulum. And it's very interesting to look in three dimensions preoperatively and see what you can achieve. So here's the, the um, just a 3D, and here's the extent of her femoral antiversion. And then whizzing through in three dimensions, just putting the femoral head where you want it, trying to give her back some, some neck length, um, looking is the room in this pelvis for an acetabulum, um, showing that in fact there is a whole lot of bone in there and getting the acetabular shape and position right. And here, here she is, um, uh, pre-op and post-op, very good correction of leg length actually, surprising, we did much better than I feared. Um, and really exactly as we planned in terms of that leg length offset. And here she is, um, a year post-op, walking, really getting on with life, enjoying herself once more. This is her two-year x-ray. Now you can see her right hip, which was doing really very well. It's failing. She doesn't want to talk about her left hip at all, but her right one is obviously going the same way. So, and we now actually, um, if people are interested and want to email, we can, we've actually got a, a web-based planner. You can actually plan this um, live um, online from a CT, which definitely allows you to see, can I actually plan and perform this or not? So that's planning. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about the actual H1 itself, which has um, been a, a project from, our, from my group, quite a few people in the lab responsible for this project. Um, it's been a long time in the making. Uh, well done, Dutchley's um, MD thesis showed us the shape um, because we were seeing 10 years ago or more how happy we were with the um, resurfacings, but the metal on metal really became a very big deal both from the metal iron levels, but also from the, the shape of, of a hip resurfacing in a woman, you've got this big metal overhang, particularly in, in the dysplastic females. So we started with the contour edge pattern a very long time ago, and first in human came up 2017. Um, we decided to use uh, Delta ceramic, it's been around for quite some time now, it seems in my hands anyway, in, in the UK, people who like using delta ceramic, the issues of, of the Biolox Forte, which did occasionally fracture, seems to be a thing of the past. And the coating is exactly the same coating used on lots of devices by the same company, Medicoat, who've been coating um, products in, in Switzerland for 30 years. Um, really a very good company. Um, no experiment there, plasma spray, titanium, and hydroxyapatite, the same as you put straight onto titanium, but this time onto delta. Um, and the delta itself is integrity tested, fatigue tested, some very interesting work taking the contour off the edge of the articular surfaces. Um, tried to make squeaking, we simply couldn't make anything more than a very quiet noise. We've had a few, we might talk about that later on, very, very quiet noises, but without a, a thin blade stem to um, uh, amplify the noise, um, really nothing that anybody else can hear. Um, without paying great attention. And the shapes came, as I say, from Wild Dunn Dutchley's thesis. Um, and we looked at, at the, the, the contour all the way around the acetabulum. And then um, Rob Waldencroft um, flipped it so that um, on the left hand, here's the iliopubic recess here um, on the front of a, of a rather shallow socket. Um, and then we, this is, can go left and right just by mimicking. Instead of, instead of having a big cutout for the um, uh, favea, uh, we just have the same shape, so it can go left and right. Um, 
and you see the difference between a, a regular spherical cup and, uh, and our cup, which has got much bigger centennial angles. So it's really um, a, a lot of coverage where you need it, but then um, it's, it's cut away where you don't need it, which is, um, it seems sort of interesting, I suppose. And the same thing on the femoral head, where we know that you have a flexion facet and an extension facet, but you don't have a huge amount of overhanging skirts medially or laterally. So we've removed unnecessary amounts of material, still a huge surface area in contact. And then the, the, the plasma spray coating I mentioned, um, this, is a, this is novel, putting a plasma spray titanium directly onto um, green machine ceramic, but we've done uh, shear testing and pull-off testing and as, you know, obviously this is a very technical procedure, the, the coating on the product, but it's, it seems as though it's very, very adherent, um, uh, very strongly adherent. Um, that plasma is taking it straight onto the ceramic. Um, and then the cementless press fit, um, both, both on the acetabular and on the femoral side, we've, we've um, we had a really enjoyable time um, with the with the bone preparation to make sure we got a press fit of about a millimeter, and then um, uh, impacting did lots of dry bone experiments, lots of um, fun um, getting that right. Uh, another time we I'd like to talk about assistive technologies. I think we all feel that um, assistive technologies improve um, the quality of surgery, and I think all the assistive technologies have a place in arthroplasty. I will just mention um, Susanna Clark and her world in my group um, on the 3D printing world, that um, her group have allowed us to make um, instruments um, which um, allow you to plan and then perform an operation. So here's a case of a, a man with a, a very bent femur. I don't know if you can see that or not, but a very bent femur. Um, uh, and arthrosis. So Susanna uh, designed the procedure so we could um, perform the corrective osteotomy and the resurfacing of the same sitting, which I wouldn't have dared do without um, a PSI guide to make sure we got it exactly right. So and the, uh, just a call out to Kartik Lagoshetti, whose um, VR work I think is going to be really a key part of, of um, training people to be really very good before you start because these days you simply can't just start doing an operation and, and learn on patients in the way um, we used to in the in quotes good old days close quotes so what about our experience so far well of course this is a very closely regulated clinical trial um, it's um, we started now in um, uh, over two years ago now and um, we've done now 100 and 20 odd cases, uh, maybe 115 cases. And as you'd expect, we've got lots of people living life very actively doing all sorts of um, crazy things. This is not randomized. This is obviously a, um, a select group of people who want to join this trial. And their scores, this is now out to two years. You see the Oxford HIP score, it's got a terrible ceiling effect. So it's not a helpful way of, of telling how good people are, but we're doing it for, for the regulators, of course. But this is a fellow three months post-op. You can't stop people doing this sort of thing. Um, they post on social media, that's what they're doing. Um, this is the uh, same man, um, Carl. He's a fantastically strong fit guy who he only ran 400 miles in the 10 months following his hip resurfacing. But he's a very fit, strong man. Um, I didn't encourage this. Um, this is very... Um, it's a little bit crazy, isn't it, to do a 79 mile ultra marathon five months post-op? I didn't encourage it, um, but that's what they're doing. We do measure objectively. Uh, um, we, in the gate lab, we're showing people exactly what, what they're doing uh, post-op, which is really interesting. Uh, we're also doing um, CTRSA uh, to show that there's absolutely no migration between this um, femoral component and the um, uh, the bone and the acetabular component and the acetabulum. So the regulatory hurdles get ever longer. Um, here's our um, patent um, uh, we wrote with Wiles thesis 2008, first in man 2017. Um, we've got ethics for um, centres in Belgium to be able to start 
um, later this year, if we're lucky. We're hoping to get EU approval perhaps next year, but the regulatory environment in the UK and Europe is very, very harsh. Um, uh, as you see, the, um, the different approvals coming through for many, many years to come. So, whereas when resurfacing the last time around was being introduced, um, Derek McMinn and his group were able to make five substantial changes in the course of four years to make a substantial change or any change at all of a, of a medical device today is really very, very difficult. So, so innovation um, is very hard and takes a very, very long time, but it's still exciting. And I, I feel very optimistic for this. It's, a, it's an exciting and, and um, a very rewarding um, of trial so far. So what's the state of knowledge today? I would say we all know total hip arthroplasty is, is very, very good for, particularly for the pedestrian and the older person. Hip resurfacing is wonderful for people who want to be more active than with a regular hip replacement. Um, but the issues certainly in the UK around metal ions make it an increasingly hard sell to the man on the street. And of course, hip resurfacing is not available in the UK for women at all and for men whose femoral head is less than size 50. Um, and that really does account for quite a lot, large group of people. So um, we're really in a hurry to get the um, ceramic uh, device through the regulators, but it won't, be, it won't be, I'm afraid, in 2020, I don't think, and I really hope it'll be sometime next year. So that's a sort of overview of, of resurfacing as I see it today, and I happily answer any questions that crop up. Hitesh. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. It was very nice listening to you and it was such an enlightening lecture on the re-emergence on hip resurfacing and the use of ceramic and ceramic bearings. Uh, there are a couple of questions uh, would be like, uh, how have been the outcomes and what have been evidence with respect to randomized control trials and what is the order rating? So what's the, what was the order question? ODEP. Oh, so um, because this is this does not have a C mark until now, every single per, every single medical device, literally until last year, was given a C mark by the company making it before putting it into people. So there was no such thing as a investigational product before. Now you have to start a trial having never done it before. And it, of course, it doesn't have an ODEP rating because it's not a product, it hasn't got a CE mark, but it is on the National Joint Registry. In fact, in 2018, it was the second most commonly used in the UK because hip resurfacing is really the Birmingham hip and that's all. Um, but um, so, so the ODEP rating, it doesn't really have one yet. We've only, been, we've only done 118 cases, I think, so far. So it's very slow. Um, the results so far are very good. We're very, very happy with it. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about it, but it is a trial. Now you mentioned the randomized trial and we discussed whether we should have our very first trial randomized, but ethically, I think it's very hard to do that, to tell people they've got to accept randomization to a hip resurfacing or a hip replacement or to a metal one. I think we felt that there is a case for a randomized trial, but it shouldn't be the very first outing. Because until now, no, that I know of anyway, all my older friends who developed things had a pilot experience for a few years to sort of wrinkle out the problems before they were in the registry. Now, our very first case went into the registry. So we can't hide. There's nowhere to hide. So it's very um, stressful, um, and, but it, what you, the, all, all our data is public, all of it. Thank you, Prof. The other question is, uh, what is the chances of squeaking, ceramic oh. head fractures, yeah. or even femoral leg fractures? Sure, so those three important points. First of all, the squeaking. Metal, metal hip resurfacing squeak. Ceramic hip replacements squeak. If you've had, there are a couple of products, particularly the blade type femurs, 
with a very thin titanium shell. And there was one particular striker product that Jack Nicholas had that really made those very loud YouTube um, squeaks. We've had several people have a little squeak, typically deep squatting, first thing in the morning, you can hear, you hear a little squeak, but it's something that you have to, and we've actually got a couple of recordings, but they're 15 milliseconds long, and I, they're between 10 and 20 milliseconds long, they're very short, and it, they're obviously a little wear, wearing in scar on an area that isn't loaded most of the time, so it's a squat, typically it's a squat or getting out of a squat. Um, so they are there, but they're rare and they're very quiet. Yes. Next one. The other one was uh, ceramic head fractures. fractures. Yeah. So um, because there is no trunnion, or rather the trunnion is bone on the femoral head and on the acetabular side, um, these are bits of delta ceramic, three mil thick. This is unbelievable. We, we've broken them. We broke them in a huge press, but the forces are phenomenal. So you have to break a person before you can break one of these. The person will break. And we've had two people break. And of course, people will break. Um, one guy, madman, in spite of pain, he went back at six weeks to being a tennis coach. Completely crazy. I really thought Andy Murray should not have gone back so soon. I thought that was crazy. And his surgeon, who's a friend of mine, also said, please don't do this. Um, because when you're healing, and some people, as part of their healing process, they go through this phase of bone reduction. You know, you, we've all seen that with a, a clavicle fracture, a dramatic osteopenia developing in response to trauma. So if you're one of those people that does that bone reduction, you, you definitely can overload yourself in the early time. And femoral neck fracture will always be a problem. And the treatment of that femoral neck fracture is a femoral stem and then a dual mobility head. Um, and that, which works very well for a Birmingham hip, if you get a fracture of a neck or a Birmingham hip, a dual mobility, leave the acetabulum in. This is a, a monolithic ceramic line, uh, acetabular component. So you don't need to take that out. Just put a, a dual mobility in. And the other thing is, uh, what are the reasons when you have revised any of these? So we've had two revisions. Both one woman fell in the shower and got a, um, a little uh, varus impaction fracture. Actually, looking back, I could have left her, but I w it was very early on and I, she had a little varus impaction. It healed, but she was varus. And I thought, well, that's not very good. So I revised her. And this, this tennis player who got a complete subcapital fracture. But all the rest are charging around, um, being very active. So, but it's a very small, you know, this is an investigational device. I'm not promoting a product here. I am promoting a clinical trial. I definitely am promoting that. But um, this isn't a product. I wish it was a product. It will be one day. I really hope it will be. I'll be very old, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor. I think that's all the questions that we have. And it was fantastic <laughs> listening to you. And this is something so new. And I think the world is going to listen to all of this. We are all so keen to listen directly from you. And I'm sure this is going to be one of the most quoted. I mean, it's going to be a, a reference <laughs> because it's global. All right. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Professor. Okay. Bye-bye.